Hello everyone, and thank you so much for attending our first panel. My name is Lindsay Murphy, and I'm a senior here at Paul College and a current MAC and AMA member. After attending MaxMAC last year as a MAC member, it is truly amazing to see this event come together and put, as I play a part in the MaxMAC magic. I am now pleased to introduce the first panel of our marketing industry leaders to you all. On our panel, we have Joan Kidden, the President and Chief Operating Officer at Architure, Lindsay Sutton, a UNH alum, and now the Senior Vice President of Strategy and Connections Lead at Digitas, Jeff Tank, the General Manager at Matter Communications, Brian Turkelson, the former global CEO of MediaVest, now rebranded as Spark Foundry, and Matt Withington, a Paul College MBA alum and now the head of Truly Seltzer at the Boston Beer Company. Our moderator is Diane Devine, senior lecturer at our MAC and AMA faculty sponsor. I'm now going to hand it over to you, Diane, and let you get started with our first MAC spec panel. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lindsay. I like that Max Mac magic. <laughs> um, welcome, everyone, and I'm really delighted with this panel. We've got very, very seasoned uh, professionals here and leaders in the industry in a wide variety. We've got both client side and agency side and people who have boomeranged and done both. And so thank you very much for joining us here today. Um, so what I'd like to do first is just go around and in one or two sentences maybe say, well, we know who you are, but say what you do and also the role that you play in the companies that you work for. So anyone can jump in. All right, Jeff, I'm going to call on you first. <laughs> so it's going to go. Okay. Hi. So I'm the GM of Strategy and Integrated Marketing at Matter. Matter is a 200-person agency that's located in Newburyport, but we have offices all over the U.S., um, and I basically lead strategy and all things outside of PR. So digital marketing, creative, building websites, doing a lot of strategy work um, in all industries. So get to see a lot in everything from healthcare to B2B to consumer. And a little insight, Jeff and I used to work together at Highliner Foods. Yes. With Mary Picard, shout out to Mary in the <laughs> audience. <laughs> all right, who else wants to jump in? Joan? Sure, hi. Thank you for having me. I have absolutely no connection to University of New Hampshire, so I'm delighted to be here and meet all of you. Uh, I have a business partner, Larry Light. The two of us have been running a consulting firm for very many years. The point of the consulting firm is to create, build, nurture, grow, and manage to maintain uh, brand businesses for enduring profitable growth. And I say enduring profitable growth because it is the most critical thing that any CEO will ask you. You can have profit, but if it's not enduring, forget about it. You can have growth, but if it's not profitable, again, there's nothing to talk about. Um, our goal has always been to guide uh, brand business leaders in managing the principles of building a brand and then being able to implement them themselves. My particular role has been as the creative synthesizer. I help our clients understand what's coming around the corner so they are not blindsided. That's why we call our podcast Future Proof Brands. You can't predict the future, but you certainly can prepare for it, and that is the role that we have been playing with clients around the world. Um, every industry you can think of, it's been a very long business, and I can say it has been one of the most exciting and fun things I've ever done. And we have had a conversation here briefly about were you on the client side, were you on the agency side, were you a consultant? And Larry and I have done all three of those, and that multiple perspective has been an incredible boon when we have conversations with our clients. Great, thank you. Who wants to go next? I can do it. I feel like you're looking at me, <laughs> so I'll do it. Um, I do have a connection to UNH, which is great. Um, I did not go to this very beautiful building, though. We were in Wisby, and we had to walk so far across to near what Christensen? Does that still exist? Did they blow that up yet? Because that was 
That was bad back then. So anyway, that's where our building was, and we yeah. barely made it to our business classes. But um, now I, lots of buzzwords with all of us, but I lead strategy, which means nothing, because it's it, it basically is every all of our jobs in marketing, but specifically for social media, for content and content creation, as well as what we call connections, which traditionally was called comms planning. So thinking about what channels, where, and really kind of identifying personas, how they use things, and then marrying that with where we should be in terms of a full integrated program. So I do that primarily for um, some of our Boston-based clients, the biggest one being Bank of America, um, but I run a team that touches much more, I would say, um, consumer things like Pop-Tarts and Frosted Mini Wheats and Crocs, et cetera. So very, very fun to be able to create both the strategy, but then also implement and create content together with my lovely team that is much, much smarter than I. Oh, thank you. Matt, why don't you go next? Sure. Um, hey, everybody. I'm Matt Withington, similar to Lindsay. I did not get the benefit of being at this beautiful school. I was the last class of the Whittemore School. I think we had an electrical fire that year, and the place was basically duct taped together. So this is this is awesome. Um, yeah, I, I get to lead the Truly Hard Seltzer brand. I've been at the Boston Beer Company for seven years. Um, I've worked across a few brands. So if you're familiar with um, Angry Orchard Hard Cider or Samuel Adams Beer, I was part of the creation of the Your Cousin from Boston character, uh, if, you know, if you know him. <laughs> uh, and then I've been leading Truly for the last couple of years. Um, and I get to do everything from setting the vision for the brand to working across all of our integrated communications. So you interact with Truly uh, on social. I'm, so, I'm involved with that with our team. Uh, any paid advertising that you see from Truly, I'm involved in that. Uh, even down to decisions we make about, you know, what's the next flavor uh, or pack of Truly that we're gonna get to launch. So it's a lot of fun. Uh, I get to be on the client side where a lot of agency partners uh, make us look really smart. Uh, but I love what I do. It's, it's an absolute blast. And working in the beer industry is just a ton of fun because it's a category that, like, you know, plays a big role in our lives and how we connect, you know, with our friends, with our families. And um, it's just fun to be in such a vibrant and interesting category that's always changing. So, yeah, that's me. And, Brian, you're next. We're so thankful to have you here. You've got such great experience. So hopefully you'll talk about it all. I'm happy to share whatever y'all want to know. Um, so I'm a former CEO. I was the global CEO of a, one of the largest media agencies in the world, um, consolidated in the same holding company as Lindsay, called Publicis Group. Um, and I retired years ago and have been uh, advising from the sidelines. And I work with students. And I work with, uh, actually, some of my former employees as a mentor. Uh, there's a thing called wit and wisdom in this world where at some point you you really can hand the reins over to younger people who have the wit uh, and they're benefiting from some of the wisdom that comes from some of us older guys. But at the end of the day, I'm a retired guy. I am out of the business. That is an intentional thing. And I'm here to tell you, get to the retirement part as fast <laughs> as you can. Right. So that's what I'm here for. Uh, but tell them about uh, Mark Burnett and all of that fun stuff that you did? Oh, yeah, sure. I have a, <laughs> I'm a bit of a mutt in that I graduated uh, university and went down to New York City and worked as an investment banker. And I did that for seven years in Manhattan, had a great time until I realized, wow, I really hated that. And I moved to Los Angeles without a plan, met a business part, met a friend who became a business partner, and we created a television show. His name's Mark Burnett. Um, our first show was a thing called the Eco Challenge, which was a 300-mile nonstop endurance race. It was a team sport. We did that for 12 years or so. And along the way, that led into the second show, which is still on air 23 years later, called Survivor. You might have heard of it. And I left that to go actually start an internet company, uh, a digital sports media company up in San Francisco in early 2000s. Ran that, took it public, uh, but that blew up with the first blow up of the internet world. And then at the f tail end of that, so 2003 is when I then came back and to the East Coast and went to New York City and jumped into the media world and the media agency world in particular and ulti ultimately became the CEO of the agency I joined. Great, thank you. Diane, should the rest of us leave? Because <laughs> no. He's, no, he's no. got it all. No. What, what was that show? Never heard of it. Okay. <laughs> Small show, <laughs> 46 seasons. No, no, not at all. You all have great experience. Um, and um, thank you. I just want, he gets to be modest, so I, <laughs> yeah, me too. We all are. Um, so our keynote, Meg Smith, who did an awesome job. Let's have a round of applause for Meg one more time. She did such an awesome job. 
Um, she talked about how important it is to ignite empowerment, inclusivity, and positivity, and to build a community with marketing purpose. How important is this for your company or your for uh, companies you worked at? And what types of things does your company do to support this? And anyone can jump in. We have a lot, I would say. So if you if you have worked in a large agency, which we just learned, so in advertising, I'm sure you've already gone through this, it's owned by four major holding companies, the big, big ones are. So we have to have a lot. So it's partly because we as individuals are good people and we should have a lot of resources for all of our you know, multi-dimensional humans that we have. But it's really on the Digitas side, which we have an employee resource group for every possible thing that you could imagine. And it's not only that we have the groups in which that you can join. So we had a wonderful panel yesterday for our Onyx group, which is essentially a BIPOC group that gets together, which many different people join, but it really, really focuses on. Yesterday was an interesting panel where they talked about name and pronunciations of names and how to talk with people um, and how why is it so easy to say Lindsay when it should also be as easy to say Anjali. Why is that you know, a challenge? And so there's literally things for every single type of person, but I think it's also based on the people that we hire too. So when it comes down to the anyone that's staffed on our team, the way that you are, for me, people are always like, your calendar's so busy, your calendar's so busy, and I'm like, nope. Like absolutely time for absolutely everyone, every problem to, you know, big, small, ugly, pretty, you wanna talk about what you had for lunch to you wanna talk about something much bigger, very, very important. So I think that's a rigorous part of our hiring process too, is making sure you have those multi-dimensional humans. Um, and I think also the brands that we represent. It's very important. I remember the one of the particular brands I work on, there was a icky issue that had happened and one of the heads of the team said, went directly to that client and said, that's not acceptable. You will not talk to our team like that. We will not participate in this work anymore. So it's not just of the days where you said like, oh sure, I'll do whatever you want client because you're paying us. There has a whole new level of, I mean, that was a, the day, right? Yes, like there are was. things that I did that <laughs> I am not proud of. Um, and that doesn't happen anymore. And I think that we all have, um, I don't know, I would say that even a lot of the newer grads and people that are coming onto our team, they have the confidence to be able to pull us aside and tell us that, and then we have really wonderful leadership, myself included, I'd like to say, that will go and fight for what's right too. So that, that's a bit more about the culture where I work, um, as long as that answers your question. Yeah, okay. perfect. Anyone else wanna jump in? Yeah, I, I would like to say that uh, we're very small, so we don't actually have that issue, but when we talk to our clients, one of the most important things is the diversity of the way people think. And we, we urge them to think about the debate on diversity, not in terms of percentages of people or ethnicities or whatever, but to think about the different kinds of minds and mindsets that you can hire and the way people offer their values and their perceptions that are so different that building your brand becomes so infected with this great ability to have different ideas present and different value perceptions. And we talk a lot about today how the, you know, all these robotics and artificial intelligence is gonna come and take your job away at the moment the way you think, whether you're a creator mind or a synthesizer mind or an ethical mind, they haven't managed to automate that yet. So if you believe that you have something great to offer and your perspective and where you come from and what you have, it is so important to be included in that brand team and that brand discussion. Great, thank you, Joe. Uh, and maybe one other thing to add too, just as we think about how our brands come to life and uh, the partners that we choose to help us bring those brands to life, um, you have to make a very intentional effort to make sure as a brand leader, you're bringing those voices into the room. So something that I'm really proud of is um, we partner with an amazing creative duo uh, named Tusk, who are uh, two queer directors from uh, California. And we just shot an incredible um, campaign for our new product with them uh, about a month ago. And it's just a different level of intuitive understanding. And it's not just about, oh, have we sort of checked for diversity? It's about you know authenticity, and that word gets thrown around a lot. That's one of the big buzzwords today. But 
Um, I think something that we've learned internally as an organization, we've spent a lot of time in those similar trainings and just really trying to understand privilege and bias and things that despite your best intentions, you're not even aware of. Um, and I think making the conscious choice in terms of who you partner with, how you bring your brand to life from casting to uh, creative directors, like it has to just be embedded in a very organic and authentic way to your brand. And I think sometimes it's underestimated how difficult that can be and how much of an effort uh, and a true commitment to it you need as a brand leader today. Yeah. Um, and then I think it just shows in a, in a very true way in the work itself. You know, it doesn't feel forced, it just feels right. We call it show, don't tell, right? We, we just need to show up this way. It's what our audience expects of us. Uh, and my job is to, you know, understand that with my team as, as deeply as possible and examine our own views of the world as a lot of us are based up here in the Northeast. So yeah. anyway, it's just a very active, uh, sort of role you need to play in creating more inclusivity and equity in your work as a, as a brand leader today. And championing that as well. I mean, I remember, you know, shooting Jell-O ads and of course Bill Cosby was our spokesperson, but as bad as he was, he was a great champion for ethnicity and we had to hire from a list of directors who were black as well as hire other people on the production team and he was the champion, which you know we thought was great. So adding that diversity, because you know at that time there wasn't a lot of diversity. Somebody else want to go? Sorry, I'm jumping in here. I mean, I would just <laughs> add that we've all touched on important parts. I think the internal part about having inclusivity means something. Meaning, great creativity is about getting a tremendously diverse ideas, making connections that aren't there, and so. We, by nature, I think as leaders, you have to not only have the people that have diverse perspectives, but also give them the freedom to express those things. And that's the biggest challenge yeah. that I see that we try to do. An example was back when I worked in seafood, we were coming up with products, we would do brainstorms. And I remember the moderator took me aside and said, we're coming up with products. I need you to say, first off, that the product idea you came up with is a seafood, is a salmon smoothie for breakfast which sounds disgusting, <laughs> it yes. sounds gross. I wasn't but, part of that, was I? And, no, <laughs> I don't think that. so, I wouldn't have let but that slide. But the whole slide. point of that <laughs> is to kind of make everyone in the room feel like every idea is great. Yeah. And everyone's <laughs> willing to throw out something, whether it's stupid or smart, it doesn't matter, but less you give people the freedom to throw ideas out, then the diversity doesn't really matter yeah. at all. That's true, very true. No idea is a bad idea. Well, Except for that one. Yeah, that one's, that oh, one well, I remember we were doing uh, shirimi uh, toothpaste or something, too. That was... Mm. Okay, <laughs> moving on. Um, marketing is so fluid and is essential in every aspect of business. What are some emerging trends that you are seeing in the industry, and what trends are you capitalizing on, and where are you pivoting? Anybody can go. I, I can throw out some if you need... Oh, go ahead, Brian. Well, I, I'm just going to jump in because everyone's going to talk about AI or augmented reality or any aspect of that, and they should because that is actually kind of critically important because that is the future and it is barreling down the road right at your kids. And it's coming hard, and if you don't really dig deep into it, you're going to miss the whole next wave of technology, the whole next thing that's coming. So don't pay. Uh, don't. Uh, pay it no heed, please get involved in AI in particular. That said, the basics that I, and I'm only gonna tell the story because I think it's relevant. When I heard this question and I just went, wow, remember 20 years ago, it was all about multicultural. Yes. Like we were all like, oh, you have to have multicultural on your plan, here's a strategy lead, right? Joan, you, I mean, you would have known this, right? You've gotta have multicultural because, wow, Hispanic is gonna count and it's gonna matter in the browning of America and, wow, they're gonna be a big number one day. And I'm telling you, as God is my witness, I've been listening to this for over 20 years. But you know what happened this past February with the Super Bowl? It was the first time that the Super Bowl, the NFL actually went out and said to the network of, you all know how the networks get the Super Bowl, right? Like it's in a rotation. So ABC, NBC, CBS, and then Fox. And it just keeps rotating. So CBS had it this year. CBS has no multicultural partnership. They had to, their, and the NFL put a prerequisite on them. They said 20% of America speak Spanish. 20% of the is Hispanic. You need to be paying attention to this marketplace. They partnered with Univision, which is a great big multicultural Latin um, uh, network, right? You probably are aware of it. The point I'm making is 
only NBC has a partnership that is Latin-based at this point or Spanish-speaking at this point is Telemundo. So that means that for the next three Super Bowls between NBC, a I'm sorry, ABC, CBS, and Fox, Univision's gonna corner the market in this. Why is this relevant? That was a huge maneuver for the NFL to do, and it is mind-numbing to me that none of those networks have created any strategic partnerships in multicultural, because we've been talking about this for 25 years. That is what AI will be when you're 40 years old and sitting on stage, and you're gonna be sitting here kind of going, I can't believe we haven't figured out AI yet. <laughs> That's the point. AI is not gonna happen so fast that you guys are gonna miss it, and if you don't understand it today, don't worry about it, because you're still gonna be questioning it in five years from now, is my perspective. So we could all talk AI and augmented reality, and we can all talk about that kind of stuff. At the end of the day, it's not gonna go that fast that you're going to be missing the train, but you can and should be leading it. That would be my perspective for this crowd. That's great perspective. Anyone else? All right, I'll go, I'll go not so future forward, maybe. Um, so I, the, a couple of things that I feel like uh, keep me up at night would be way too aggressive. I like to sleep, but I would say that more so cookies going away obviously yeah. is a big thing, which is very, very difficult for um, advertisers in general in terms of how you target. But this is another one that has been, ta been talked about for so long at this point, and now it's here. It's like, it's here, it's happening, which is very, very difficult. So I'd say that keeps me up at night because that one-to-one -one personalization all we talk about is like being authentic and reaching people one-to-one -one and knowing their behaviors and knowing these personas so well that you're going to reach them with the right message, right time, right content, that goes out the window when everyone has to sort of look the same. Um, so I feel like that's a big one. And the other big one that, is spe specifically because I focus on finance a lot, is the wealth transfer. I'd say that that's another big thing in talking about, especially millennials and Gen Z together will inherit over $80 trillion in the next 10 years, and they will become the two wealthiest generations that we have ever seen. And so if we do not know how to market to those two generations, if we do not understand who they are, again, now the cookie problem, that makes this a little bit difficult. So those two things together really help me to say, like, how are we doing this right? What type of information are we creating? What type of movements are we creating? What type of brands are we creating when we know that these two things are at play? Exactly. Good. Matt? I think another interesting change um, that's exciting is the way that the creative model works is changing. So. Um, well, and I'll also kind of weave this in with data. So uh, we have more than enough data that we even know what to do with. And I think there's uh, a tendency sometimes as marketers today who have a lot of data to let the data tell you what and then fail to understand why. So I think that that's one thing, sort of this over-reliance on I have a lot of data, but at the end of the day, we're still talking to human beings. But where the, the creativity goes is, you know, the, the old model was like you'd hire an agency, they'd come up with one big idea off of one big insight that you know, worked for every single person in your target audience from the ages of, you know, 21 to 99, and uh, they'd all, you know, buy into your brand. I, I guess, show, show a quick question for you guys. Like, how many of you think that you all came to UNH for the exact same reason? Or do you think that there's, like, a lot of different reasons you guys chose UNH, right? So uh, I think that, you know, as we think about the evolution of, like, creativity, messaging, marketing, like speaking to your cohorts, understanding the different needs that you serve across different segments of your audience and not relying on like one big, you know, $5 million spend in January to carry you for the entire year. Like the model of how brands become influential, how brands speak to you uh, and connect with you is changing. And you see this when you look at uh, creative agencies cutting staff. You look at you know these agencies that are stuck in this old model of like one big shiny idea. Um, so for me, I think it's twofold. It's it's taking the data that's telling us what, so that we can understand why, and then it's just changing the way that we reach people. Like that is evolving overnight. The way we consume content is evolving, and the way that brands need to speak to you is changing. And the brands that don't get that right now are a lot of the big slower moving brands that are struggling. And I think that, you know, uh, uh, Love Lexi is a great example, right? Like understanding segments, understanding the needs that that brand serves for its consumers. So uh, I'm excited about the shift. It's time for the shift. And I think any brand or even, you know, creative or strategy partner who doesn't see that uh, is going to struggle in the years to come. Great. I will add one thing, which is data in a different way in that and it's also something I love, which is I feel like so much, because we have so much data in marketing, 
I work with a lot of mid-sized companies and we are just part of conversations around running a business because just marketing is so core to driving revenue like it never was before. So you're in conversations around how the company runs and how it's such an important driver and with data to actually support that arguably more than ever. So I feel like that's a massively positive change. You know, sometimes we're not even working for marketing. We're working for a chief revenue officer or sales and just the worlds are kind of combining into one which gives marketing a lot more power, which I like. So <laughs> that's, that's a good change that I feel like is happening. Great, thanks. Um, so we just talked a lot about um, some of the trends that you're capitalizing on and pivoting. And when you think about that and you're doing your marketing now, in terms of what are you finding most effective in reaching your target audience, particularly with consumer behavior and their preferences, what kind of tools and tactics and strategies are you utilizing that help? I could start this one. I mean, speaking to real human beings and, yeah. li and listening to them. You know, like as much as data is important, some of the richest learnings that we've had is like when we get in a room and follow people, not even just get in a room, we will follow people around for several days and do uh, ethnographic work ethnographic. To, to really understand, uh, you know, as an example, like if truly is all about uh, you feeling light, well, what does lightness mean to people today? What are the things that get in the way of people feeling light? Right. How do, you know, lightness is not the same for me as it is for you. So uh, I think it's, for us, it's, it's complementing and understanding at a much richer, deeper level uh, who our audience is and just like where we fit in their lives. And you know, being really like real about that means you've got to dig in and go deep. You're not going to uncover that in data. Yeah. Um, so I think you know, as much as data is helpful, at the end of the day, we are trying to connect with humans. Uh, and we're all busy. We have lives. I have a young son. Like, I, you know, I don't walk around thinking about my favorite brands. Um, so our job is to, is to understand our audiences uh, as deeply as we possibly can. And then, you know, be as clear as you can possibly be. If your brand is not clear, it's really easy to skip past a brand that isn't clear and wants to be everything to everyone. So, so for me, it's, it's going yeah. deeper at a real human level. So primary research with them. Yes. Like ethnographic mm -hmm. research. Is, are, is anyone using social listening tools? Yeah, mm -hmm. all the time. Yep. All the time. Which yep. one are you using? Uh, it depends on the client. We love Brand Watch. Yeah. That's going to win always. It's like never, never dies. It's so good. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, what are you using? We use Brand Watch yeah. and a few others. But yeah. yeah, Sprinkler. Mm -hmm. Anybody use Sprinkler? We do use Sprinkler, but not for the listening because that yeah. sucks. Sorry if you're here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just add sure. up and Absolutely. Research? Because I, I agree with you. And one of the things that I heard from the Love Lexi presentation, but that we have been doing with clients is problem solving to the degree that you look at consumers and what their problems are, and they tell you what those problems are. And from a marketing standpoint, there is nothing better or more successful than solving a customer problem. Uh, when you ask people what they want, they will give you generic stuff. I mean, we talked about this yesterday. We did one with dog food and we asked the dog owners, what would they like? What do they want in a dog food? And they all said, I want food my dog will eat. <laughs> if you've ever had a dog, they just about eat anything. I can't go to R&D and say, make something the dog will eat. Right. But I can go and find out what the problems are, and there are thousands of them. Mm -hmm. And customers, I mean, the one thing we are really good at as humans is we are great at complaining. You ask about problems and you will wind up with five, 600 problems for something you never thought existed. But when it came to dog food, it was really easy. That stuff stinks. You know, I open the can, it's too big, it sits in the refrigerator, it gets all dried out on the top. You know, forever problems that you then can take to R&D. And the same thing happened with the bras. I mean, you know, ask people what their problems are you solve those and it's a winner. Great, anyone else wanna jump in there? I can give some very like tactical examples too. So for, for things that we're trying, if you, I don't, does anyone follow Pop-Tarts? You should, 
because it's really it funny. Mm. The community management especially is funny. I feel like community management and social media has had like a big resurgence, specifically because I think, and you guys could all tell me if I'm wrong, which please do, that Gen Z really values that exchange where you're going to commit and you're going to spend time with a brand and you might even think about it outside of work just because it's entertaining or it provides you some other utility or value. So Pop-Tarts is a really good example. Like it is comical what happens within their community management. Their posts are really, really good. And we spend a lot of time, we have a very good client that buys into that. So they're open to it. They kill a lot of our ideas, most of them, um, but we still keep bringing them all the time. Um, and I think that, that that trust and that relationship helps. But at the end of the day, it is, it's kind of really valuing the humor and their interaction and making sure that it's not going to be, we're not going to put something out there that we know that our community isn't going to love. Um, so that's a really good example. And then on a total other side of the spectrum for Bank of America, there's a, a stream of content that we put out organically, um, not with any paid, that is really kind of elevated stats and statistics um, unique to what's happening in your day-to-day -day life. So the thing is, is that if we're all inundated with content all the time. So there's some dude in his basement and he's just giving out financial advice. But you have Bank of America who's arguably might, might know a little bit more than this gentleman in the basement, but he has a huge YouTube fo following and he's putting out advice. So how do we compete with that? So we found some really interesting ways to convey information that is very, very contextually relevant, timely. So if you know, you're know you very interested, there might be something that's happening via social listening. Um, and every morning we have a newsroom and it it's talking about food. For whatever reason, food and groceries bills might be higher than normal. Then we'll make sure that we talk to our economists, put out content that's really, really compelling, that's about that specific thing that the community is talking about. It's super simple. It's not groundbreaking. We've done it for years, but being able to elevate that content and make it that much more compelling in your feed and give you something that the guy in the basement can't do because he doesn't have the economists on speed dial is a differentiator for Bank of America. You know, uh, the Pop-Tarts example is a great one. I don't know how many people saw the stunt at the college uh, football playoffs, but to me, that's just like an example of a brand understanding what that brand is about, understanding who it's for, and in a really self-aware and fun and creative and attention-grabbing way, bringing that brand to life. And I think Do you know was, what like we a did? it was like a $2 million bowl spend. And you know, uh, yeah, maybe we, share we that We killed example. the mascot yeah. live, essentially. We put him in a giant toaster <laughs> and he jumped in and he toasted and then the players ate him. Like it is, <laughs> It's ridiculous, but you should, it's it's out there, you can go watch it, but it's because of that fandom yes. that we knew that people would absolutely love it. And in my question after, as the team is walking me through this, and I'm like, well, do we have another mascot? What happens after that? Are we inventing new people? They're like, we gotta figure it out, because he's dead, right? He, well, we can't talk about What was the sign it. he held, like dreams do come true or something, because yeah. he was going into the toaster? And yeah, then he, he threw the sign, which was <laughs> not part of it, and he just chucked it into the field, and he went into the hot toaster. And it, it's one of those types of things where, again, just really, really leaning into um, what we know that that community will love. How fun, very creative. Wow, okay. Um, my next question was going to talk a bit about more about content, social media, influencers. How are you all using them and how are you creating and managing partnerships? I have a lot of answers for these questions, so maybe I'll let someone else go and then come back if we I have a lot. You have probably a lot. What? No, absolutely not. I know the brands you have. You go. Um, well, you added content that wasn't part of it. But I think <laughs> content is everything. We know that. And it's really, really hard. And I think it takes what we've learned as we've grown our group, because our, our group is essentially a startup within a bigger agency, that we get the stuff that clients don't want to do because they're really hard. So creating content is one of those things. Doing amazing social. Community management is like the top of the list. It's massively time consuming just to do it, but to do it well is even harder. But I mean, the influencer part is a big part of any smart marketing program. And I think I touched on on the keynote, but authenticity is just a huge aspect of that. So I think you can all see when something doesn't feel like it fits perfectly right and where it just feels like someone's just getting paid and to do it. And so we would always want to believe that that match, really understanding the influencer's brand and matching it to the brand of the client. And oftentimes that means smaller audiences are better than bigger. It doesn't matter the size. It has to be about fit. And <clears throat> just like anything you're doing in marketing, it's the consistency of those relationships. So we try to have longer partnerships with influencers and make sure that 
that brand is getting out there over time. It's not just one paid thing that just feels inauthentic. Yeah, you know, creative and context. So for us, like if we're gonna do something kind of wacky and out there, we look for our brand friendlies who uh, have cred in that space and whose audiences expect that from them. And then we work with our media partners to place that content in places where people are looking for unexpected content, right? Like Reddit is a great platform where you're looking to, you know, you wanna share something weird that you did, Reddit's a great place for that. So um, I think it's, again, going back to authenticity, it should just feel organic, right? Like the right content should show up in the right places and, and influencers, it's obvious when you've just hired someone who has a lot of reach. Uh, we look for engagement with their audience and we try to bring the right ideas to the right partners to help us uh, bring that to life. So I think that that's more important today than ever and it's just too easy to scroll by the stuff that you know uh, is, is just sort of forced and paid for. As long as you have the kill clause in your PSA uh, because otherwise this goes on and ad infinitum forever. A uh, kill clause in the personal services agreement with an influencer, sorry, a PSA is a personal services agreement. As long as you control mm -hmm. the kill clause, so that if you don't like it, you can pull it back. But like that's the number one thing in influential marketing is making sure that you control the kill clause. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else want to add anything? I, I mean, influencers, I was talking to a group last night. We were talking about the difference between influencers and creators. So I'm going to ask the same question I asked this group. Are influencers, if you think that influencers and creators are the same thing, raise your hand. You think they're different? Raise your hand. Yes. Okay. But that's a big shift. That wasn't a thing, you know, 15 years ago. Influencers, that was on your, that was like on your resume. You, you had no, oh, this is going to be so mean, no unique talent. And you were paid because of your reach, right? It was an advertising play. And now we're in this world of creators where there are people that are uniquely skilled at crafting and creating amazing content. Because like Jeff said, it's very difficult to create content as a brand. It's a lot of resources. It's a lot of time. It's maybe sometimes not always worth the squeeze. So creators are great. Uh, we use them a lot across all of our work, um, both influencers and creators, because they serve different purposes. We're working with a particular influencer right now, a celebrity in sports because we want his reach. It's very honest and true for why we're using him and how he's going to show up because we need to sh essentially shed more light on a program that we're doing. Very, very simple. Do I want that gentleman to create anything? Absolutely not. <laughs> he is very good at throwing a football and that's it. <laughs> okay, and then there's a different group, right? There's a whole creator group that we use to really help create and change the conversation around maybe some bland materials that we have, or we want unique and in interesting ways, whether it's for R&D or whatever it might be, and truly create. And that's a bit more of a listening community that you build with creators, and we use those all the time as well. But they are distinct and different reasons to use. And even within our agency, I often correct a lot of our comms plans that have them used as the same, and I'm like, hold the phone. What are we using these people for? And I think to the point earlier where using individuals who have really great stories, we're filming a four-part docu-series right now that will launch around the Boston Marathon that is just, these people, I had never heard of them before. They have very large followings, but they have such interesting content because of who they are. And it is our job as brands to be able to share that, not just always rely on them sharing it on their own channel. So it's a real, I would say, a give and take with the brands these days where I want to put money behind that as the brand because it's such a great story. Yes, it serves me as a brand, but I'm much more excited about them being the main character than the brand. Great. Thanks. Do you want in? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, my concern always with things like this is the fit. And a lot of times people come up with an influencer or a partner or a collaborator and the fit is so bad mm -hmm. that you have to just say, wait, this is, this is just wrong. I mean, I'm thinking about what you said, things you were embarrassed that you partook in during the time when it, they said, do it. And you know, I have a lot of those, but I fear that in many cases today, it's people are so eager that they forget what the brand stands for and what the brand's provenance is and, and what values it's supposed to deliver and reflect in terms of your audience, mm -hmm. that connections are made where you just don't get it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like Marlboro saying, we're gonna hook up for a 5K with, you know, the American Lung Association. It's just, it's wrong right. and it has no credibility. So. Being able to really know what your brand is and then get the appropriate one across the board is so absolutely critical. You just destroy all trust when you 
go to. But I also think that brands are actually getting a lot better with us right now. They're 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 they getting are. younger leadership. They're who get the space. I remember dealing with M and M's and trying to integrate them into a television program. And the M&M's had an attitude. They had a segment on Entertainment Tonight, which was a TV program. I don't even know. It could be still on. I don't know. But the M&M's, uh, I w uh, they were going to eat cheese with Tom Hanks and some French thing. Don't ask. I don't know what this is all about. But the BBDO, the big agency, the big scary agency came out and said, oh, no, no, no. M&M's only eat M&M's. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> M&M's only eat M&M's. They don't eat cheese. You couldn't possibly do this segment with, and I thought, you have just jumped the shark. So in, in a way, I think that the brands themselves have also kind of figured out how to broaden their horizons. Because if you're going to go into a creator space or into influencer space, the brands have got to be brave enough to say, OK, you're going to need to do what you do, because that's how you are connected to. And again, that's why I say you need to kill clause, because I'm just going to let you go do it, and then we're just going to see. And if it doesn't work, then I got to be able to do what you said, Joan, which is like, it just doesn't fit. I got to pull it out. Yeah. But yeah. So it's OK. I worked with Mars for years. I, yeah. I have the character book that they originally uh, put no, together. Joan, you might have written that, for all I know. You might have been the person who wrote me the memo <laughs> that said, no, that. no, no. I could have done that. <laughs> we loved M&Ms. Susan, Susan Creedle's the one that came down so hard on me. Did, we did M&Ms. We did Snickers. Uh, you know, And they're still using the same intrusive hunger thing that we came up with. But That's great. yeah, I agree. I mean, I think that the brands are much smarter, much smarter than they were. I think the agencies have changed the way they approach these instead of going for, it's a great deal, we should do it, pulling back and saying, wait a minute, there are some other things here. On the other hand, you see some and you just say, I don't get it. Then you see some like, you know, the Weather Channel saying, we're all going to wear Carhartt, and it makes such incredible sense that you know, you, you have a lot of feeling of, okay, this is working out, but it is it is something to keep in mind that we always say, figure it out first, because you can really make a mistake. Yeah, you know, I think brands are, oh, sorry, I think brands are getting smarter, because I think they're really understanding their essence, as well as taking the time to do the brand work, uh, to do their brand positioning, to make sure they understand their brand personality, to make sure they understand their purpose and their why, um, as Love Lexi showed us today. Um, sometimes when I teach that, I think students think I make that up, but it's real. <laughs> and I'm glad you guys also validate that for, for us. Definitely. I would just add, too, once you have that foundation, right, yeah. understanding what your brand is about, right. uh, your cohorts, your audience, you know, then it really does become about the power of the creative idea. And between a, you know agency and client, uh, the times when I've experienced the greatest success is when you can walk in a room and not tell who's the agency and who's the client. Mm. And it takes a lot of trust and a lot of bravery. And it takes the client to say, uh, you know, my creative team that I get to partner with are like creative wizards, right? They take what we wish to tell people and they find a way to say it in a way that our audience actually wants to engage with it. And it takes a lot of trust. Like when you take those big swings, you take them together. Mm -hmm. You present the ideas together. And that's how you get these powerful ideas that break through, whether it's the Pop-Tart stunt or you know some of the things that we have done on, on Sam Adams. Like the power of that agency client relationship. Uh, you know, I think it's the client's job to be a great client. And that includes writing a great brief, understanding your brand, and then trusting your creatives to help solve some of your biggest challenges with you uh, and stand you know, with them when the ideas work and when they don't. Like sometimes the times you build trust are when you, know, you take a big swing and you miss, yes. but you don't point fingers and you just say, hey, we went for it and we're gonna go for it again. So that dynamic between agency and client, I think is you know, always been incredibly important and maybe more important than ever. Go ahead, Jeff. I was gonna ask, did you ever have any big misses? Anybody? Oh, yeah. Tons. Definitely. I mean, I don't know. We have, well, we're tight on time. I, I catch really. Yeah. T tons. Definitely. But you know what? That's fine. I think when you miss, usually the downside is nobody notices and nobody cares. Yeah. And when you hit, then you've got everybody's attention. The downside is usually not yeah. you ruin your brand. The downside is usually you waste your resources. Right. I was just going to add that you mentioned fundamentals, and you... I, I go back to fundamentals of marketing like 
multiple times a day. Like, I'm not just saying that because you guys are back. The stuff you're learning now, we are dealing with on a daily basis. Like, going back to positioning, going back to, do you even know who those, the pain points are, who your customers are? And I work with a lot of B2B clients, so having been in consumer for a long time and then taking some of those learnings to B2B, you're, you're constantly going back to those clients who are trying to reach a CTO or uh, of a cyber client. Like, how do, they, how do they get the essence of what their brand is? And you're talking about a buyer journey that's a year or two long. All of those fundamentals are massively huge, and most of them don't really have them down. So you're getting going back to those basics all the time. Yeah. Yeah. So hear that brand positioning hear st statements, valuable, <laughs> valuable. Great. Um, you talked a little bit about data and data is key today. Um, tell us about how do you look at data in your decision making and how does it drive the approaches that you're taking? Anybody can, Lindsay? I'm the least data -y of these oh. people, I think. <laughs> I feel like you were gonna say something smart. Oh, Joe, sorry. I, well, I, I, I mean, data has its place, and, uh, and, I, and I think it's wonderful when you can, but the biggest problem that I've seen is that there's some kind of mystique about measurement that people look at the data and they expect it to reveal the truth when in fact data do not decide, you do. And you know, at Mars, we wrote this book called Marketing at Mars, and it was a big deal. And there was this one page that said, um, at some point in your job, you need to be the one to make the decision and take that leap of faith on an informed judgment platform. Uh, my concern is that we have a lot of people, I have had a lot of clients who say, I'm going to wait for the data to tell me what to do. Um, and then if it fails, the, I can just say, well, you know, the data made me do it. Um, I, I, and I totally give up on all my accountability. And I'm concerned a little bit about the power of data because if you believe it's going to tell you what to do, you're headed down the wrong track. It's your job to take that data. Data do, you know, I mean, it's different from that voice in your car that says, you know, turn right at the next light. It's making a decision for you. You don't have to listen, but it's telling you what to do. In real life, that's not the case. And we fall under this mystique of measurement that makes us think whatever the data show, I'm going to implement tomorrow. And then I, I basically given up that control. We, yes, we do a lot of brand strategy work and I think when we started doing that, I did it the traditional way. So we're gonna do four months of personas, we're gonna do all of this amazing research and clients were getting frustrated, we were getting frustrated. So we said, all right, well what if we use data to help um, shorten that. So what we've done is saying, we know a lot, we are experts, so there doesn't have to be a right answer. At the end of the day, it is someone's judgment, so let's come up with three, and we'll help have data help push clients who can't make a decision to at least have another input, and you can evolve things over time. And I think that is the bigger uh, other difference is there isn't a right answer, there's things that work that you optimize over time, and that's what data has helped us do, is get to the answer or an answer quicker, and then if it's not right, so what? You can adapt and you can move on. I think another reality of what you're saying, relying on data. So something that's maybe not talked about that much is this, the tenure of a chief marketing officer today oh, yeah. is increasingly short. Mm -hmm. And right. the pressure for immediate sales overnight business results is at an all time high. Um, you look at things like what happened with Solo Stove, right? Which, you know, a massive buzz driving campaign didn't deliver. Uh, sales overnight, CEO is gone. Um, so I think CMOs are, are, are more accountable to business results in a shorter time period than ever before. So then it makes the creative bravery that we were just talking about between agency and client riskier. Uh, and I think sometimes it's that crutch of, I wasn't wrong because the data told me uh, to do this. So it, again, it's not ill intended, but it's coming from uh, definitely on the client side, pressures for business results 
and a lack of willingness to maybe trust the music and rely more on the math. I, I completely agree. I mean, I think this is one of the sins of marketing is that the gap between the CEO and the CMO has gotten so broad um, and that the role of the CEO in many cases has become, um, you know, the, she, the, the person who is just managing the circus, you know, managing the communications of all these different areas when in fact the CMO should really be, you know, the leader of the brand business mm -hmm. and is being put in a position that is completely not tenable yep. for any one person to do. Uh, and, and data has a point there. I mean, I, you know, I agree with you, it, it, but data, is not there to decide. It's called navigational guidance, yeah. not navigational yes. decision making. Yes. And we've got to be able to take the guidance from the data and implement it based on what we know as experts. The only thing I'll add to this is that in a cookie-less world, data is absolutely critically yeah. important. It's how we're going to know we're getting the growth, Joan, that you actually talked about. The very first thing you talked about is being around growth. And I would agree that, yes, the CMOs and CEOs are kind of on divergent paths around growth. But at the end of the day, and we're going to discuss that because that is huge. But at the end of the day, the data-driven marketing is nothing new. That's certainly been around for years. But data-driven marketing that ties back to the dimension for brand and the brand story itself. Now that's coming together in identity graphs. And if you're not studying identity graphs, please do. But uh, the identity graph is what's going to actually begin to help answer these questions, especially for a marketer. I'm sure you've got identity graphs. The reality of it is, is that that whole interpretation and attribution is critically important. Mm -hmm. And in a cookie-less world, you're going to see these you know, new star, I think was just acquired by a credit union, by a TransUnion or something like that, right? So new that acquisition, look at what just happened in Walmart buying a television manufacturing exactly. company called Vizio, for God's sake, yes. for $2.3 billion. But what department bought that? What department of Walmart bought a $2.3 billion television manufacturing company. Which department? The marketing department. Mm -hmm. So your CMO greenlit marketing, and why did he do it? He did it because of the 500 advertisers that are on that, but the, nine, but the 18 million subscribers that are in that Vizio world. That's a marketing move. That had nothing to do with the CEO. Yeah, I'm sure the CEO agreed to it, but let's be really clear. That is all data, because yeah. we're getting away from data and we have to understand. So I understand where you're coming from, from a creative perspective. Boy, you better have a gut and human connection to it. But at the end of the day, if you haven't got that science to support it, and I don't know how many people have out here, I know Ian is, but I don't know how many of us out here are interested in the data side of marketing. The data side of marketing is going to be huge moving forward. It is going to be a wave that cannot be stopped. So don't take your foot off that accelerator. Keep going down that path because interpret interpreting that data and the data sets that we're gonna be getting now is going to be the future of marketing because we're moving to an on-demand world and I don't wanna get into all that, but yeah. automated content and content recognition and that type of things, I mean, I caramba. I mean, that is, <laughs> that is gonna I make caramba. all of us here obsolete and you guys are the ones that are gonna do it, I hope. Because <laughs> so, these people are expensive. We need to get rid of the expensive people and bring in more efficiencies. <laughs> CMO, CFO talk. Yes. Did you want to add something? Just going to plug. Uh, one of our capabilities at Digitas is called DNA, which is all of the data-driven marketers. And I refuse to be in meetings without them. So if someone's like, oh, I want to pull up with you to talk about a strategy, I was like, cool, 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 let me grab Benjamin. Or cool, 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 let me grab Meredith. Because they are the people that I want to partner with to make sure that my silly, creative, maybe smart ideas, they are hypothesis-led by what they've shown me, but they're the people I want so that I can prove something out. And I will throw weird things at them. I was like, do you have the LTV, the lifetime value of all of these people? And they're like, no. I was like, could you make it? Could you find it? They're like, yeah, give me a couple weeks. And it's those types of people that you need within it. So if you are interested, it's just like a curiosity. It doesn't mean that you have to be good with numbers at all. It's much more about a curiosity type thing and understanding trends. The DNA, or for us, any sort of analytics capability is key. Okay, so I'm getting the time signal. Um, so, 
because we want to also leave a little bit of time for Q&A from the audience. Um, if there was only one thing you hope that the students and the people in this audience will take away as a result of our conversation today, what would it be? Okay, it's two. Okay, you can have two, I'm Brian. I'm greedy. <laughs> He's always, you know, needs I'm problematic that way. Yes. One is you're all either in the interviewing cycle right now or going to be in the interviewing cycle at some point, and some of you may be in the interviewing cycle at some point. There's only one word that describes you. It's called capable. So write that word down and use it in an interview because that is the word that will best describe you. And if you aren't capable, then don't go for the job. So that's a key word that I want you all to just take away. That's the shortcut to getting a job. The second thing I want you to know is Joan said something at the beginning of this that made me go, hmm, she's totally right. And it's something that I always harp on. You are all, every single one of you out there is responsible for growth, period. That's it. And the more you like make sure your manager knows that you understand that you're responsible for growth, and I don't mean just revenue or margin or share value, I mean whatever it is, frequency, distribution, penetration, it could be brand loyalty, it could be brand, at, uh, whatever, Equity. retention. All of that is you are the growth. You are responsible for the growth of retention, you're responsible for the growth of penetration and distribution and everything. You're also responsible for the growth in culture and you're also responsible for the growth in um, uh, diversity, for the lack of a better word. I mean, this is who you need to be. So in in, imbue that, imbibe that rather, and become a growth officer, period, full stop. Do it in your life as well. A capable growth officer. Please. Okay. <laughs> um, I'd say, you know, entering a career in marketing is signing yourself up to be a lifelong learner. And some great advice I was given early on was that you're never going to master this craft. It is constantly evolving, mm -hmm. constantly changing. And uh, if you could master it, you would and those people would make tremendous amounts of money. None of us up here have all of the answers. We will continue in search of the answers. And to me, that's the exciting part. It's what gets uh, me out of bed excited to learn something new, like a day where you learn something new. That's almost every day. And um, you know, you're just signing up for that. So you're always trying to, how do I understand the audience more deeply? Like the more you learn, the more you're like, wow, geez, I have a lot more to learn. So it's a, it's a bottomless pit of learning. It's a really fun challenge. People are so dynamic. We're just trying to like make the tiniest impact in their lives to be very effective for our businesses. And um, I think, yeah, just sort of recognizing that the learning doesn't stop here. You're gonna step into that role and go, oh my God, I have so much uh, to learn. But if you love that and want to embrace that, it is the best career in the world. There's so many days where we sit around and go like, I can't believe we get to do this job every single day. That's because day. you're drinking Trulies all day. <laughs> yeah. Peak creativity is around two and a half Trulies, uh, <laughs> for sure. But, uh, but yeah, I, I, think that, I think that's it. You're, you're signing up for an amazing career, but uh, a career where you're never going to stop learning. I would add that, as mentioned, marketing is many, many different things now. So uh, it could be data, it could be creative, it could be a lot of things. So I would think about what you really love doing, and there's this place for you. And I think we were talking about at lunch about, you know, when you show up in, for an interview, it's about showing you care and showing some passion. And to me, the way you do that is by doing things you know you're good at and knowing and doing things that actually get you excited. And if you figure out what those things are, there's a place for you to do it and excel in, and that will all come through as you figure out your next steps in your careers. I have two things too, if I'm allowed. I'll You're go allowed. Fast. Okay. The first is definitely in the same vein of just having a great attitude. I, I, it's, a, it's a silly thing. I was told once that I shouldn't say yes so much, and I hated that advice. I hated it so much, and I realized that advice should only be relevant for a small period of time, and I carried that for a long time. But I was saying yes, not because I actually thought it was all a good idea and because I was going to do all those things, but just to show that I was willing, I was able, I was capable. And so I, I think that the people on my team, the people that I I've, I've hired multiple times at other companies, they have carried them with me throughout my career, is because they've also been yes people. Yes and, not yes but, yes and. We learned that very early on. So just that attitude, just kind of 
like bright eyed and bushy tailed. I don't know, it carries. I'm not this happy all the time. I go home and I'm miserable, but at work, <laughs> happy. So it's, it's one of those things. The second piece, I had very good advice from a mentor of mine, get mentors if you don't have them, of all ages, of all shapes and sizes. I will be all of yours too, please sign me up. But um, she said to me that you have so many chapters in your life. And because I was deciding between a job, should I take it, should I not, which one? She's like, who cares? You do it the next couple of years. You do it the next, you, it's so many chapters. I remember leaving here and saying I had to go work in an advertising agency. Plot, like no advertising agency would hire me because they said I didn't have advertising agency experience. How was I supposed to get that? I was here at UNH, it doesn't make any sense. How do you get that experience? There were no agencies I could go intern for at the time. And I was so down and I ended up having a different path and that was fine and then I ended up at an agency. It was just a chapter. So I don't know if that gives you any sort of like sleep. You will get your resume out. You will get a great job. But it's just a chapter. And there's going to be so many chapters. So there's, I think that I have probably like 30 more chapters, hopefully. So just keep that in mind as you get down. Or if you are in a really, really good one, you're going to get to another better chapter too as well. So just chapters. If you live your life that way, I think you're much better off. I, I like that. Okay. Um, but I, I, I think... I mean, I think about things like planning, you know, life planning, which is one of the biggest oxymorons you can have because life is so random. But I would just suggest that as you start looking for jobs that you are interested in, that you not just look up, but you look laterally as well, not be too linear because sometimes the opportunity that's over here, over here, but not up the step ladder approach to life and your resume is gonna be the best opportunity for you. I can tell you that if I, if I had stayed with the life plan I had, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be doing something else that I really wanted to do at the time, but was not possible. And then all these other opportunities came up and Th those things happen. Life is like that. They're going to throw you something that you weren't expecting. And all I'm saying is just completely keep your eyes open. Do not do the linear thing. Uh, obviously, you want to have the best resume possible, and you're looking to climb that resume ladder. But please don't blind yourself to looking at things on the outside, because it is so extraordinary the opportunity you can have that comes here. And also just one tiny thing. We all were talking about brand, which is you know what I have been doing for the last, I don't know how many decades. And I just want to say, if there are any people in the room who are considering getting a marketing and a law degree, Will you please keep in mind that there is no legal definition of a brand, and yet we're all sitting here saying brand loyalty and brand equity and brand power, and there, you can, it, the only legal definition we have is a trademark, and I know there are people here connected to the <laughs> AMA, and if you go on the AMA website and you look at the definition of a brand, it's the same definition it's as not a trademark. A, yeah, it's not a good definition. And therefore, we have a huge problem because a trademark tells, you know, protects and identifies the source of your product and service. But a brand is a promise of a relevant differentiated experience. So you trademark products and services, you have to brand experiences and don't let anybody take your brand experience away because there's no legal definition in court. And so if anybody wants to do law or IP along with marketing, please keep this in mind. I, I, it's been my bugaboo forever that we just can't make any progress on this. All right, I'm gonna have to shortchange the questions so I can take three. So if you have three urgent questions, um, the uh, microphones are coming around. Sherry. You were talking a lot about data, um, which I know and understand how you can get that from digital advertising. It comes along with it. But when you place television advertising, I don't know if any of you do, or you put product placement in television, how do you get data out of that? I just don't know. 
or don't you? You do. The, you do. In a similar in a similar way in which you're getting it, um, television is more digital than I think you might imagine. Um, and so you understanding the placements, product placements are also really interesting. Um, great partners like Nielsen and others um, can actually calculate all like out of home, anytime your brand or logo shows up across non-digital billboards, sitting here um, in, you know, at a particular event. This happens a lot with event and in IRL type marketing. So think of, just I mentioned the Boston Marathon earlier. Think about the amount of logos that are across that whole course. How could a brand who sponsors it understand the value of that? Well, there are partners like Nielsen that can come in and be able to assess that. Same thing is true for TV. So you're getting, we are inundated with all of that information. You know exactly, especially when you also look at most TV today is through a set top, like a CCTV, a connected TV that has every thing in there. There's also a special ads to your TV, not ads, additions to your TV that actually will assess who you are as a household. So we actually know how many people are in your home and exactly how that message is resonating too. So there's a lot of builds on that. It's a fascinating, fascinating segment. Any other questions? Um, hi, I have a question for Matt specifically. So the Boston Beer Company has seen incredible growth over the past few years, especially just looking at like the hard seltzer industry since 2016. Um, and we're seeing a lot of different trends coming up. Um, I'm thinking about uh, like the introduction of the vodka sodas or like increasing percentages. Um, what's your favorite way to stay up to date on these trends and bringing them back into your office when you're looking at future brand growth? Yeah, great question. Um, so. This is where you know you're not going to see those trends sitting behind your desk. So we've got um, the one of the coolest parts about Boston Beer Company is we have the biggest sales force in the beer industry, uh, even though we're not the biggest beer player. Uh, our founder calls us like a baby with a 20-pound head, <laughs> which is a really weird way to describe it. But um, you know, with that comes the ability for people to see things and to be you know always on top of the new trends that are emerging and. For me and my team, like we try to get out in the market as much as we possibly can. We try to go into bars uh, in, and sit with people and see what they're drinking, just watch what they're drinking. And you know, you just have to have your eyes open. And this is where, you know, sometimes that shows up in data, but sometimes, you know, you're not tracking things that are super small. So, you know, as an example with Truly, uh, there was a, a, a brand in the Northeast called um, Spiked. And it was like started, I think, in Connecticut. And um, our sales team sent it to uh, the office and was like, hey, have you guys seen this thing? Um, and we were like, wow, that's a really interesting product. And you know, we fast followed and Truly and White Claw essentially launched at the same time. So being, a, being you know, eyes open and a really fast follower has been a big part of Boston Beer's strategy. And uh, it's just, yeah, just staying on top of trends, getting out, seeing what's out there, talking to the person who's like working the cash register at a liquor store, they'll tell you a lot. They'll be like, no one's buying that thing anymore. This is the only thing people are buying today. Nobody you know, under this age or over that age cares about that anymore. So it's just getting out and being curious and just trying to keep your eyes open to, to what's happening and then understand your brand enough to, to know whether or not you have the credibility to stretch into those places and whether that can you know, serve, a, serve a need that you're maybe not serving today. All right, thank you very much. Let's give a big round of applause to this panel. Thank you all so much for this great first panel. Listening to all is insightful and inspiring, and we can all strive to be industry leaders like you all someday. Thank you so much for sharing your expertise and being a part of this year's MaxMac. Next, we have our second panel, where more marketing professionals will share their experiences. Following our second panel, there'll be a networking event in the Great Hall. I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you.